Welcome to another Collective Conversation. I am your host, Mike Brewer, and today I am joined by Jindu Lee, founder and CEO of Happy Co. And this is Jindu's second time around, so what I would do is refer you back to the first episode so you can learn all about him and or go to LinkedIn. He has a fantastic LinkedIn page. But Jindu, welcome to the show. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm uh, I'm hyped up on coffee, so oh, awesome. I hope you're ready. <laughs> I, I, I was born ready, but yes, I'm ready. <laughs> I actually have to tell you this. I, I uh, ordered this bag of, uh, it's called goat coffee. Right. And the claim on the side of the bag, I don't know if it's actually true or just marketing, is that it's the strongest in terms of caffeine content. I don't know how to put that, uh, but the strongest coffee in, in the world. And so uh, you'll be the first person I've talked to while drinking a cup of goat coffee. That, that's awesome. Man. I, I was wondering why you're so excited today. So I thought it was because of me, but I'm glad it's. <laughs> <laughs> I walked right into that. It certainly is because of you. <laughs> yeah, that's just funny. Yeah. Um, well, hey, I um, I really appreciate you coming on, investing some of your time. I know as a CEO and a founder of an organization, it's it's uh, you know I, I don't think past my imagination that you're a pretty busy guy. So thank you first and foremost for taking the time. To be here uh, you're welcome i i'm not that busy but, but i but i appreciate the yeah where it's coming from <laughs> well, I, I think i think it's funny like it's it's something that we um I, I try to not be busy and i think it comes from like knowing that i'm not good at a lot of things and so <laughs> i try to do all the things i'm really good at um you know there's this book called strengths finder i don't know if you've yes. heard that before right and yes. and, and we, we kind of use it at, at happy co and yeah i I remember in my 20s, I learned this thing where I read that book and went, you mean I don't have to focus on my weaknesses? That's amazing. And so I think I've kind of taken that a little bit too far and, and, and get, given the things that I'm not really good at to other people who are really good at it. And so that frees my time up a little bit more than um, what, quote unquote, like a normal CEO would would, would have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that, that It makes a lot of sense. I, th- I think uh, <laughs> it just brought to mind when you – when we've been thinking about property management as of late uh, and, and how we sometimes try to put a broad hat on team members, be it on the office side of the business or on the service side of the business, we ask them to do a little bit of everything when in reality, if we tried to get a little bit more pointed about what they were really good at and organize our work around that, we'd probably get a more efficient outcome potentially. Yeah. I mean, like, I always think like um, <clears throat> McDonald's is a really good example of that, right? Like you, you, it, it's really weird because over the years I've spoken to a lot of people, even internally, Happy Co or whatever, and they all like fight against that. Oh, no, I need to do more things versus like I just flip the burger. All I do is just flip burgers. And what do you do? I put the patty on. I put the patty on. What do you do? I, I put the, the burger in the and wrap it up. I just wrap it up. I just wrap it up. Like, I think if, if we – that would be a really efficient workforce, but I don't know. Maybe there's just this reluctance for people to, to, to embrace that. I, I'm not sure, but I think it should work. And it could work, must work. Yeah, I think so. As long as you introduce a little bit of variety in that you, you know, if you're flipping burgers on Monday, you're, you're putting the bun on, on Tuesday, you're putting the cheese in on Wednesday, you know, like, so there's a little bit of novelty, not novelty, but uh, switching yeah. it up a little bit. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's something I, I, I always fantasize about, like, well, imagine <laughs> if we could, I could do that, but then maybe the reality is it might get monotonous and boring. And so that's why you need, kind of need to switch it up. Like, Maybe, but 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 there's, there's something to be said where if you switch up and people get to do other things in the organization, then they get a really good like, holistic sense about why things are being done. You know what I mean? Like, but what? Why is leasing just not doing their job? Well, have you done leasing? Yes, I have. Well, that's because they have to do X, Y, Z, and you're like, oh, so they're not trying to make my life hard. No, they're not. So I think that there's something uh-huh. to be said there too as well. <laughs> I. I, I love that. I want to I want to go down this road just a second. So I, I literally literally just got off of a call. We're doing some leadership development uh, with a we ha- we uh, have this organization called Wild Spark uh, that we use. They're just a pl- online platform, but they give you a lot of prompts and questions as it relates to leadership in in uh, general. The topic today was the why behind the what, and you're probably familiar with Simon Sinek's famous yeah. quote of understanding the why behind. I I'm curious. Um, you know, you just described a scenario where telling somebody the why behind the what kind of helps them have this light bulb moment. Oh, somebody's not making my life. Is there a scenario of that where you sort of flip that around and, and you, when you give the why behind the what and somebody actually pushes back on you and says, well, well, why, 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 why does that ever give cause for you to actually change a 
oh, process. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I think I think it's two things, right? Like one, when you tell people the why, people still don't understand, mm. right? And, and that's why I think like by by literally being in someone else's shoes and doing their job, then that's the true understanding of like now I understand the why because you can say you know why we do this is because you know if you don't do this then uh, all, all of the prospects coming in won't get pushed to the next part of the you know the, the leasing process mm-hmm. but they're like so who cares but if they go all right you go run that process yourself then they go now I know why I got to enter the you know the, the process the person that just came in the door right, so I think there's, there's something to be said there and then on your second point um like I, I really think that and I believe that I don't have the best ideas and, and, and it's very dangerous for like leaders to, I don't know, like, you know, leaders get into positions of power, whether they earn, earn them or not. And then they start to think that they have the best ideas. Um, I want to be challenged all the time. Do I have the best ideas? And if you kind of, you know, hang around happy co-employees and myself, you, you would be really, it would be really shocking to you because you'd be like, does Jin, is Jin know the CEO? Because he's getting yelled at by his employees. <laughs> and, and, and to me, I'm like, I welcome that 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 debate because, um, you know, I have an idea, you have an idea. We don't know whose idea is the best. So let's debate and, and figure out who has the uh, the more sensible idea. And even at that stage, it doesn't mean my the, what, what we end up um, deciding on is the best. The, the next thing is then test it out, right? And if it does, if that idea doesn't work, go to your idea. If your idea doesn't work, come to my idea. If mine doesn't work, let's come up with a new idea. So I think it's really just that, like, and, and it comes to that why. Like, uh, I think you have to keep challenging the why because it changes. And um, yeah, I just think people then respond really like people have to be part of building the why. I think is the, the what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, that that makes sense. I, I'm really curious because I I struggle with this a lot in in the leadership role. Um, in, in, at Radco, I call it arguing, fussing, and fighting. And, and I, I like that, right? I like for people to argue, fuss, and fight, whether it be what, it doesn't matter what it is, right? As long as we're not attacking character, uh, or individuals, then every, everything is subject to. And I'm just curious how you foster that sort of environment where people, I mean, you described it as people yelling at you. <laughs> I imagine that's part and fun, but yeah, but I, like, I desire that, but I'm, I struggle to know how to like, I know it's predicated on trust and things of that nature, but what are some practical things you do to make that okay in your, in your company? Yeah, it, it is very hard. And um, I think like it's really hard for, especially for new people joining the organization. Right. And, and again, there's the copper answer of trust, but like, like if you want, let's maybe unpack that. Cause I'm going through that right now, right. In the organization, like we've happy co, co- has grown, um, you know, from like 80 people a year ago to now 200 people in the company. Congratulations. Um, really wow. short time. I, I don't know if that's congratulations or condolences, but uh, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, it's interesting because the people that have been with the company uh, for, for a while and has grown to like, you know, I've had conversations with them over the last four or five years. We know each other really well. They are very comfortable with disagreeing, uh, you know, debating, right? Because they know that they're not going to get "Quote unquote fired," <laughs> yeah. and in some companies you do. Some companies you you, you know you, you talk back to leadership. Mm-hmm. Come to my room tomorrow and see you later. Mm-hmm. But like a lot, so a lot of people don't know that they don't have that same context. And so what I've experienced in the last um, twelve months, and even like we're trying to figure that out today, is um, some of the newer employees. They when I say something, they they don't know what like if they disagree, they just go, "What should I say?" Like they don't know what to say, and I'm like. If you disagree, tell me because I need to know it and, and we can work through a better solution. And I think it's a few, so a few things that I've done, which may or may not help. One, obviously, is trying to spend more time with the new employees, but it's really hard as, as the organization grows. So maybe you, you pick and choose, um, you know, in, in, in a group of five, maybe two or three in that new group, kind of just to, to just get to know them and they know you a bit more. Um, but I think what I did recently um, yesterday was, you know, I joined one of our team meetings. It was a marketing team meeting. And I'm like, oh, cool. I wonder why I'm here. And they're like, everything sucks. And each one took turns to kind of say why it sucks. And um, and I think they were like very worried. No one wanted to, to be the first to say it sucks. Um, and it's a pretty new team. So so I'm like, that was great feedback. So now I've got context. And then I and and so I think what I did was like, hey, I think. I mentioned your this team. I have really high trust and confidence in each one of you. 
Okay, so there's nothing to worry about. That, you know, if 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 and being very candid, I said if I had problems with any of you, I would have told you already, and you know we would have another discussion. But I don't. I I, I think everyone is great. And then it really just came down to me um, really very, very explicit around like how, how to communicate with me. You know, if I'm communicating a certain way, mm-hmm. I'm asking, I'm doing it because I'm trying to get feedback. So don't take it the wrong way. Um, and, and so really at setting the norms, resetting, I think that has to be continuously done and done. And I probably forgot about that because I assume everyone's in the company for a long, long time. And, and anyway, so that, that's like a very practical thing, going back in, spending that time to build that, that trust, being very explicit about, what's good and bad, what you're, you know, and it's not just me, right? Like they, I need to know how they want to want to be interacted with and this is how I want to be interacted with. But yeah, I don't know, maybe because it's, there's not just one way to lead as, as you know, it's like different people want different leadership styles. And, yeah. Oh yeah. That, that, that is absolutely true. It, it makes me think there's, there are potentially scenarios in your organization where, um, so you have a blend of new team members with a blend of those team members that have been there for a while. And if a new team member sees a, a, a veteran challenge you in a way that, that you like to be challenged and they see that and they see your response to that, that's probably a helpful scenario too. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It, it, and, and so I don't have, there isn't a lot of challenges with, with that happens because there's like people that have been in the company that can kind of back up what I'm doing and say, Oh, that's how Jindo likes to blah, blah, blah. And, and they're like, oh, cool. So they, they they understand, but for the newer folks with no previous context, it's really, whoa. He just like, is he angry? <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not angry. I'm really, I'm really happy. And I think there just needs to be that, that reset. I guess um, it's just like any mar- any new relationship, right? I, I mean, yeah, every new relationship, you kind of figure out what do you like. Oh, I hate you brushing your teeth in the bathroom. Oh. Whatever it is, I don't know. But you know, it's just that that. Oh, well, if you told me, I would have stopped because I don't care where I brush my teeth. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I think that's kind of something along those lines. <laughs> Stop squeezing the tube. Roll it up and put a binder clip on the end. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love that. Well, I I, I want to segue into something because I I think that's a good preface for. Um, you recently, uh, and, and please correct me if I misstate this, but I purchased, uh, recently purchased Yuhu. Um, and, and if you could just help our viewers, listeners understand what Yuhu is, was, and will be as it, as it relates to Happy Co. I'd, I'd love yeah. to hear that story. I read it on a, on a press release. So recently, so. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, no, normally like we, I'm pretty, I, I'm pretty much against trying to tell people that we've you know, acquired companies and stuff because I feel it's like a very um, like uh, inward focused exercise. Like I want to show the world how great I am. Sure. Versus like to me, it's always like what what benefits does it drive for the customer, right? Like if, if we're doing yeah. something, what what's the benefit for who we're serving versus hey, look at us, we're great. Um, so <laughs> we didn't want to announce it, but there was some reasons why we did. But um, Yuhu today is uh, they they do leasing. They have a software for leasing. They have a resident portal for um, you know for the for the residents, and um, they actually have like a, a maintenance piece as well. But um, but the, but the leasing and resident portal were really strong. Um, they have about two three hundred thousand units in Canada using their, their software. Um, they work very closely with their customers to build co build solutions, mm-hmm. um, and really like the reason why we wanted to do the acquisition is um, probably for two reasons. The first one is obviously there's like strategic value in, in, the, in the software offering and I can touch on that later on. Sure. Um, but what it really came down to is I spent probably four or five years uh, with Hugh Collias, which is uh, their CEO. And every time we caught up, it's, it's never been about like, it, it's not about, you know, Oh, my, my company's better than yours. It's always just like, Hey, what, what do you want out of life? And I'm like, this is what I want. And I'm like, what do you want? And he's like, I just want to build, you know, great software for the industry. And to me, I had the same thing. I'm like, same here. I just want to keep building solutions for multifamily. Um, and year one, both of us are very skeptical. He's just, you know, uh, he's just paying lip service. Year two, we said the same thing. Year three, year four. And we got to the stage where we're like, oh, I think this guy is genuine. And, <laughs> like this, uh, um, and so I think that was like, for me, the, the ideal marriage where it's kind of like your high school sweetheart, you know, you've chatted a long time, then you both dated someone else and you realize we should be together and <laughs> something along those lines. But um, I, I think it, 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 for me, it was just like great people, 
um, great products and just that cultural alignment with what we have at Happy Co. So that's why we, we, we made the deal happen. Um, yeah. I, I, I love it. I, I know you personally, I know Hugh personally and, and you two, uh, that seems like a match made in heaven. The, the two of you together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but you know, like with every new um, relationship, there are like after the honeymoon phase. I mean, we're still going through it. There's going to be some challenges, but I, I think we both come to it with very candid. You know, like, tell me what you hate, and I'll tell you what I hate. And you know, like we we jumped on the call a week ago, and and he's like, hey, this what we're doing here doesn't work, and I really hate it. I'm like, great. <laughs> Thank you. Go, go fix it. Like, see you later. And, all right, see you. and I think it's just like keeping that very, um, that transparent, candid dialogue. Um, I think that helps you to get through a lot of like challenges, essentially. Yeah. I think now, how is that, if, if you, if we work from that premise, how is that impacting? Because I imagine when you're, when you're blending, even if the cultures are very much aligned, yeah. When you get down to the the people who are actually doing the work in the organization and you're blending those two cultures together, how, how's that working out and where do you see the the pitfalls and, and the advantages and opportunities? Yeah. So we were really fortunate. Um, so we had done a couple of other acquisitions in, in the past, uh, much smaller ones, really just to get, you know, test the waters, get our feet wet. Um, and we haven't, one of them hasn't had best experience for the the target well, we're still working with them but like we learned a lot through that process of what not to do so i feel sorry for you know, the, the other acquisition but um we just learned a lot of what not to do mm -hmm. and um so we took uh, yeah again like being you know stepping back do a post-mortem what what worked what didn't work how can be better so with with the yuhu acquisition we uh we we realized that the integration or post acquisition is actually very important what, what happens after the, the acquisition um so we have like a, a gentleman by the name of keith nelson um he you know, he's done he was at paley's uh, he was a bunch of companies before president paley's he's helping to do the internal integration for both companies so having someone focused on that is very important that's what i've learned mm -hmm. from a cultural standpoint um we so we have our own set of core values that we run and mm -hmm. you know um the idea was that you like whoever buys the the company essentially the, the one that gets sold kind of moves to the, the new company like that's that's typically how it is understood so hugh was very um aware of what he was stepping into <laughs> um and, and then it was interesting because then we every year we go through an exercise at the leadership level where we talk about core values and you know do we, do we still think we have the right core values? Do we need to change anything? Um, so we went through that this year. We, we did it with Hugh and, and you know, the leadership team of Yuhu. Um, and there was actually like one core value I hated, or I hate a strong word, one core value that didn't resonate of Happy Co. And um, it was supposed to be look outward first, right? Look outward first. And the, the, that core value, the, the, the meaning was supposed to be put yourselves in the shoes of others. Ah. Specifically, customers, <laughs> right? And, and, Understood. And so, and so like, because when you build software, you, you know, people always go, "Oh, look at this cool software, use it." And then the technician or the you know, leasing manager is like, "This is so hard to use," and that's why you have all these legacy systems that are really hard to use because there's like they're not thinking about the end user. <laughs> right, so, right. Um, anyway, so so that core value we kind of missed the mark on that because um, we interpreted that as like, "Oh, just you know, doing." going above and beyond and, and all that stuff. No, no, it's actually supposed to be like, think of the customer. Uh, you who had a bunch of core values that all matched up and aligned and they had one core value, which was customer obsessed. That's the name of it. And I'm like, oh my God, that's more what we're trying to do. So we ended up, what we ended up doing was to add that to replace our core value and all the other ones kind of slotted in really nicely in turn, uh, with the other ones. And again, like it sounds really punitive, but what that shows to the Yuhu team is that we are not saying you have shitty culture, your culture sucks, ours are the best. It's really like, let's find the best of, of what we're trying to do and then rethink the way we, you know, how we act. So that's, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's one thing that we did. It, it, it does. It seems like you're, when, when I think about core values, I, I think about the word trust and, and that's sort of the, the, 
if trust is the foundation, then the core values are, you know, like the, the keystones and the, the corner blocks and, and starting to build. And, and I think it, it makes sense to me, or at least the story I'm telling myself is that you, you took a lot of time to make sure that that, that trust foundation was there. The five years you spent with you bringing that team together and actually taking some of their work, uh, and blending it with your work seems like the, the right pillars or yeah. you know, that are going to build a strong foundation. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I think it's working really well. I'm really excited. Like their team's super engaged, super excited. Um, and you know, I think something that is, isn't explored as much is like how you structure the, the, uh, the acquisition in, in terms of like incentives for, you know, the other party. Right. So, um, I, I can touch on that if you want me to, or I, I, please. Yeah. I'm, I'm a um, sponge. I, <laughs> <laughs> me too. Um, so like it, it, I've seen it a bunch of different ways. Like we, we've nearly been acquired a bunch of times. Right. And, and we've always pushed back on it. And one thing that I, I think <laughs> is a bit of a miss is, um, you know, a lot of acquisitions, how you structure the, um, the earnouts or the milestones drive the behavior of, the people that get acquired. So um, I've seen in other cases where you would structure where the company you acquire, you give them revenue milestones based on their product or whatever it is, right? Like if you're, you know, let's say in, in you whose case, uh, I don't know, like leasing, for example, and then you go, all right, we need you to hit like 10 million in revenue for leasing. But the longer term vision of the company is one, like it's different. So then you have to figure out what is the right, like earn out structure to get us to, to the joint like goal, if that makes sense. So it does, it um, does. Yeah. Cause otherwise what's going to happen is if you, let, let's say for example, the joint goal is to build, I don't know, like a uh, hundred million dollar revenue business um, and to do these five things. And and then you go a year down the track, you go, Hey, um, you who you should come and help build this other thing. What it can do is you can actually drive the wrong behavior and say, no, 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 I don't want to. Cause I, I'm, I got money that I need to make here. I don't want to like play nice with everyone else in the organization. So I think I'm being very deliberate either on the structure or just having that, like you need to bring in people of high integrity that understands the bigger, the the bigger goal. Um, Yeah. So I think that's a very important piece and and there's no, there's no right, wrong, right, wrong answer, but there's just like a lot of like gray area and trying to figure out what the best outcome is. And we spend a lot of time (laughs) trying to figure that out. Yeah. It, it it makes sense to me that you're if you're if you're not aligned and in, in aiming toward the same outcome, I, I could see where people, if you're running off in two different directions, it certainly makes <laughs> running a business very difficult. Very challenging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's hard. It's hard enough just running your own business, right? And so That's right. if you have a new new party, so um, yes, yeah, so it's one of the big lessons that I've learned in the last you know like two three years doing a bunch of acquisitions. Like, wow, this is important how you structure things, and and actually like. Um, re- when you realize you've structured it incorrectly, being able to, again, it come, comes back to the trust, being able to kind of go, hey, I think we missed the mark on the structure. Let's build, let's change it. So we've done that um, in the past with our previous acquisition. Uh. Um, and, you know, like lawyers would say, oh, it's impossible. You shouldn't do that. Oh, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, you know, like I, I think just being practical, like I had a chat with the, the other founder and that we acquired and I'm like, hey, I think we should change it to this. And he's like, yeah, sounds great. Okay. <laughs> like, do we need to like, you know, go through big legal? I'm like, nah, it's, it's, it's just an email. Like, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, at the end of the day, let's shake hands, right? And, and, right. and, and agree. Um, maybe we're just under old school. <laughs> uh, you, you know, it's interesting. It, it, uh, I, I imagine there was a day, uh, I may not have been alive at the time, where, where a handshake deal, you know, yeah. and, and people just, um, you know, were reasonable and, and could actually work through. Our our founder tells a story about um, a gentleman who was doing a condo development in LA, and uh, it was during 07, 08 and uh, obviously oh seven oh eight hit, and this condo development was put at, at real risk, and and it actually <clears throat> went into a workout, and our founder was out there, and he sat down with the the developer, and he said, you know. I, I think we should work together here. What would you have done differently? And the developers like, mm. I wouldn't do anything differently. I did everything right. <laughs> and, yeah. but what he didn't realize is that the, you know, the business climate changed, therefore the business plan needed to change and he might've pulled that thing out and been successful, but yeah. it, it's just, you know, bringing two people together in a reasonable way usually has a better outcome than 
fighting. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. It's yeah, I agree. But yeah, but I don't know how that works. Is it is it just is it trust that does that, or like do you attract like minded people? Like how, you know what I mean? Like there are bad actors out there, or different actors. I shouldn't call them bad because everyone's <laughs> good in their own view <laughs> point of view. So how does that? Yeah, I, th- I think I, I don't know. I I. The story you tell about yourself and Hugh and spending five years, let's call it courting um, one another, I, I, I think it's t- like it, it probably boils down to time spent, right? And yeah. the yeah. investment made in the relationship prior to the actual, like I was listening to a venture capital guy today on a podcast and they were talking about, do you pick, do you pick the horse or do you pick the technology or yeah, yeah. You, you probably know this better than I do, but he, he's like, I pick the person every time, but I only pick the person every time because I spend an inordinate amount of time getting to know that person. Yeah. 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 No, I, I would agree because um, early stage startups is really hard and mm-hmm. I have a tough time. Because right? Happy Cove, if I pitched Happy Cove 10 years ago, which is what we did, it's a stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Hey, so you're going to have an app to do inspections. Okay. Like, is that even a good thing? And like, <laughs> it's like that sounds so dumb. Like, I mean, it sounds like a good I, 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 like feature, but right, 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 you know, right. Like, can you build a company around that? I don't really know. And in my naivety, I'm like, yeah, I guess so. And, and so um, I'm really glad about very early investors who just went, I don't even know multifamily. I don't even know like prop tech. I don't know anything, but you, you sound like a good guy. And, I'm going to put in some money like, and those guys, like, yeah, like, I guess they backed the person. They could have backed the wrong one, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think it's totally the, the friends, the families, the, the angel investors. Yeah. they they believe in you and your yeah. idea and, and they go for it. Uh, so I, I can't help but to ask, so you, you made this acquisition. I, I love technology and I pay attention to, to all of you guys and all of your companies, not, not all of them, obviously that's a pretty broad statement, but the, <laughs> But I, I make an attempt to, so I'm always thinking about like connecting all these dots in my head. Well, I wonder if you did it for that reason or that reason or that reason. And, and I'm not going to speculate here out loud what I think, but I'd love to know what the reality is. And yeah. Um, yeah. I want to make a billion dollars to buy more Ferraris and Lamborghinis. <laughs> it, it, it totally is. I knew I was, it. I knew <laughs> it. Yeah, um, like, yeah. So I think like, um, I think in the last podcast I may have mentioned it, but like to me, I I just want to build and solve multifamily problems and challenges, and you know, just kind of mm-hmm. build build as many things as we can to solve the problems today. Um, so with kind of that lens, you know, like I, I think of it as like, what if we could build sort of like the the ultimate data re- resource for multifamily, and and I don't mean like for you know, one specific area, like everything, operational, asset management, like all, all the all the pieces of information. And if you think about that lens, you go, okay, well, how do I, what do I need? Because there's a lot of a, uh, BI analytics, like companies out there today. But right. like they, what they're doing is they, they're essentially like, there's like, I can think of 10 today, right? We want to consolidate the analytics, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, that, like that, there's no space special source to that it's really just taking data and then putting a, a visualization tool on it um mm. some of them are, are better than others they have like a bit of smarts behind but the way i think about it is like what we need to be doing is to to generate what we call first party data first party okay. data is essentially um to generate that you it's through workflow software workflow you know tools and so i think of it as like well what, what if we could build a, an organization where we have the best in class point solutions that all integrate with one another, right? And, and, and also allows for like real integration with other third party softwares as well. So not just this, you know, we have an open API, but it's just lip service and it doesn't kind of not really open. I think like, right. what if we can build best software, build by whatever, bring in the best software, best in class software and still allow for competition to enter the market, right? So if we have a, a leasing tool, let's take our, our maintenance software today. Um, we have about three and a half million units on, on, on our maintenance product, right? So mm-hmm. if you if you can use ours or you could use something in the market that's like, you know, like maintenance IQ or something else, it doesn't really matter. Like we will integrate with anything and play nice. 
if you want to use our leasing product, you can do that. Or you want to use something amazing like funnel or anything else, you can use that as well. Mm-hmm. And really allow the, the the customer to just benefit from from what we have. So that's how I kind of think about it. And then if I go, all right, so then what pieces do I need? We 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 were strong in maintenance. We were trying to build a resident portal. You who already had one, so we're like, oh, that's great. And as we did the app, like going through that discussion, we're like, oh, you guys have leasing? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, that's how we think. So that's why we did that acquisition to kind of expand expand what we're doing. Um, in the, the last 12 months, we've built a, a, um, a tool for CapEx and renovation, right? So then, like, again, tools that don't exist in the market today, CapEx and renovation. We have a budgeting tool that we're working on right now to do annual budgets in, in the cloud. Um, our due diligence tool is doing really well. Um, and then the way I, then I started thinking, okay, well, let's not limit ourselves to software. What other challenges? So I, I, again, we start from the challenges and the challenges, um, and I think we, we've chatted about this before, like, you know, I went around, actually, um, you were probably one of the people we met a couple, three years ago. I think I was in your office and I was like talking to you guys and they're like, Hey, what's some of the biggest challenges in your industry? And they're like, and I was trying to sell you main work order software That's and, right. <laughs> and you were like, oh man, we have a 60% turnover rate on our technicians, right? Like it's hard to find labor and this is pre COVID. And I had the same discussion with 10 other folks. Um, that the same, same thing, like, yeah, labor shortage, blah, blah, didn't know what to do with it. Um, and then COVID hit and now, you know, like essentially what we've done is we've spun up a services division, um, and to provide maintenance labor to the industry. And again, so it's like not software, that com- like entirely software. But to me, I'm like, I just want to solve problems. Like, who cares? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so we have like the on-site operations for day to day, you know, leasing, um, uh, maintenance and resident portal uh, compliance. You have your asset management piece for what the asset managers need to do their job, which is today mostly in spreadsheets. And then we have the services side, which is the um, yeah providing humans <laughs> to do work. <laughs> yeah. I I remember that at the time. I, I remember the, the conversation that you referred to. And then I had, I think we had a second conversation that was actually a Zoom call. And you were talking about the concept of, of uh, the, the humans actually going out and doing service requests. And, and so is, did that come to be? And then I also want to, if that is true, I'd like to hear more about it. And then you've also segued into happy force, which mm-hmm. I, I got to, I have to admit you, you invite uh, somebody from your team invited me to be a part of a panel that we did recently. And I thank you very much for that. It was wonderful. And, but I, I have to admit, I had no idea that you, <laughs> that happy force was a thing until we got on the, on the call. That's so funny. And then I was like, jaw drop, like, Oh, that's so <laughs> cool. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it all kind of led, led to, like all things kind of lead to, yeah, I guess what we have now. Um, so what happened was, okay, everyone had labor shortages, mm-hmm. all right? That's a problem. Then COVID suddenly hit. And I was like, oh, crap. If they have labor shortages, imagine what it's going to be now. So then I started like calling a bunch of people and I'm like, hey, um, what's going on with your maintenance? And they're like, oh, you know, like we're actually doing, we're solving some of our, only the really big issues we might go in, but a lot of it's like using FaceTime, Zoom calls, whatever it is to, to, to talk to residents. And I'm like, that's working? And they're like, yeah, for the most part, it's kind of working. And so we thought, hmm. And, and, and at the same time, you know, uh, you never went to see a doctor anymore. You did telemedicine. So you do a Zoom call with your doctor and they're like solving, you know, 50% of like issues just on the phone. All right, you need to buy this or do this. Um, so we just took that concept and we started ex- experimenting with this thing called, we call it Happy Force today. And Happy Force is, um, so we have like, man, all these maintenance technicians that work for us. And these are 10, 15 year like industry veterans. Um, some of which have like, a lot of them have like disabilities or you know, they can't walk, they tore an ACL, they've got a bad back, but they know the industry really well. They know maintenance really well. Mm-hmm. So we've, we've brought together like a, a virtual remote workforce of technicians um, that we that work for us. And what we're trying to do is to solve maintenance tickets essentially yeah, yeah. yeah so that, that's kind of the premise of, of the happy force idea it's a yeah so for all of you out there listening this is why you have a labor shortage because <laughs> you hired everyone i'm just kidding i'm just giving yeah. you our time <laughs> yeah 
it's actually an interesting point because we um the folks that we've brought in like you know every friday they get to, all the technicians get together and they do like a hey this is the new person join that's and so you awesome. listen to their stories and oh my some of them are just like, people always end up crying after those calls because it's just like you know this guy was um he he tore his acl on, on site and he couldn't work um he was going to be out for six months and he literally needed the money like he's like mm. i'm getting let go tomorrow uh we brought him on board and he's like oh my god this is this is life-changing right and then there's another story where um this guy his kid is not like in poor health and he had to spend yeah. more time at home um being able to work <laughs> virtually like that's just yeah. a game changer for him and, and a lot of these people are just like wow i i was at the end of my career i couldn't do this and this has just given me an opportunity to do what i do best that's been great you know, I, I love that for two reasons. I, have you ever seen the, the, uh, TV show, new Amsterdam? It, it's a yeah. hospital. Yeah. Is it, there's this one scene that speaks right to this point. There was a, a doctor, um, who would, who'd kind of reach the, the end of his sort of usefulness in a, in a surgery or in a room where he's yeah. doing surgery. Um, and he was, but he was trying to kind of like make his way through these sort of health checks every year, like fake his way through him so that he could continue to do his surgery. But at the, you know, the punchline was that they segued him into being like a tele doctor and actually using the knowledge to your point, the service team member being able to use all this knowledge that they've collected over the years. It's, it's interesting. Also, I was reading a book recently called strength to strength, you know, old guys like me, we start to think about what are you going to do in the second inning? Yeah, yeah. And, and so, but, but the real thesis of the book is that, Hey, when you reach a certain age, your, your ability to do that task oriented or more kind of mm -hmm. strategic work gives way to you becoming a teacher or, or a mentor. And, and you have to accept that the thesis is, Hey, look, accept that for what it is and just go, go do that. And, and it, so it brings that to mind in the, in the way of these lots of service team members. I mean, I've been in, been in the business of like 30 years and I know lots of these people that, man, you look at them and they, they're just full of pain, but they're just doing it because they, they don't have another opportunity. Yeah. Right? That's the only thing they, they know. How. And, and, and you're, and like the, some of the, um, like I've learned a lot or our whole team has learned a lot going through this happy force journey. Right. Cause we originally thought it was, oh, great. We solved tickets and, you know, we take away the, what we call like the dumb BS tickets. Right. Yeah. And we thought that was the value. And, and it is like, we're, we're solving maybe 10, 15% of like tickets virtually, which is, which is great triaging, uh, solving them virtually. Um, but the, there's actually a lot of benefits that come out of it. So, um, like the resident, for example, so the resident, Typically, when they put in a service request, it's like a 48-hour turnaround time. Right, right. If that, like it's probably 72, a bit more. Um, sure. Our technicians are responding to tickets within seven minutes. <sighs> you know, and, and so as a resident, you're going, I just put that work order in and uh, oh my God, someone just reached out to me. <laughs> like back off, man. You're kidding. No one does it. Yeah. This yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so like for the resident, they just feel like, oh, I've been heard. Um, this is awesome. And then our technician is then working with them to, to triage, like, hey, tell me a bit more about the problem. Um, and then you get things like, um, oh, my, 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 my bathroom's leaking. <laughs> You're like, what does that mean? Right. And, then you, right? and then when you diagnose it a little one step further, oh, it's actually my faucet has, is leaky when I put it on the hot setting. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then our technicians are really smart. So then that middle of the time, like, oh, basically what you do is like, turn the handle this way and tighten this and then it should be fixed. And then so they walk the, the resident to do it themselves. And the resident's like, Oh my God, I, 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 I did it. Um, so the resident experience improves greatly as well as part of this. It's so that, that brings to mind, I, I would imagine that like, I, I can think about myself. If someone just walked me through and I fixed myself, I'd be happy with that. Is there any, is there a, is there pushback from residents in scenarios where, like I pay rent here. I want somebody to come and do this. I don't want to talk to somebody over the phone. I'm just curious more than anything. Yeah. We, we, so when we first like was like going out selling the service, we got a lot of pushbacks from from you know management companies saying, "Oh, my residents don't want this. Like it's they they you know they 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 pay rent. They want to do it. Like want you to do it." And right. So, um, what we've learned is actually it, it's the secret sauce is in how you have that conversation. Ah, uh, got it. Yeah, okay. Right? And, and so our technicians, and because like everything is, so we actually tech enable, like give our, our own virtual technicians, like the software, 
the technology to, to, to empower them to do their jobs better. Understood. Um, which means by default, we actually have all of the, the, the SMSs that they do, the emails, the video calls, everything's recorded, right? Got it. Um, and, Got and both, it. So both parties know they're being recorded. So it's not like a secret covert thing. But um, <laughs> what, what ends up happening is we, we train our technicians and well, they, they train themselves. I don't train anyone. They train themselves to be like, how do you have that conversation with a resident to make them feel like this is this is more of an option? We can still send someone in, mm, but that makes like, sense. If, if you want it to, if you want it solved faster, or, or me to solve it for you, or together, let's do it. And I think that is like a, a phrase, like more phrasing than anything else, like how you phrase it. So that's been really exciting for us. That that's awesome. I I imagine that same sort of how you have that conversation includes like, oh hey, a, a resident fixing that thing is probably a little risky, so we're not going to let you do that. We're going to call somebody. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the other pushback is like uh, liability, right? Like, what if the yeah, yeah, resident yeah. puts their hand in the uh, garbage disposal <laughs> and then the hand gets chewed up? And I think like we so a we actually have um, insurance or coverage, so that mm -hmm. if that happens, then you know, but. The most important thing is not letting it get there in the first place, and and, and so we were really I was really worried about this, and um, it really comes down to experience and common sense. So if you were working with like imagine it's like working with someone on site that comes in, like they know not to do like right. So as yeah. part of the qualification, you just know like oh is your is there a cable hanging and it's like buzzing, <laughs> don't touch it. Like um, garbage disposal. Okay, don't you know? Being very clear, don't put. And there's a lot of training that we give our technicians as well to, you know, hey, be very clear about your instructions. Don't put your hand down there. See that button. Press that one first. Did it work? Oh, it's, there's like a. Okay, there's a spoon in in the. In there. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, make sure to turn everything off. If you want, if you're comfortable, we can. I can walk you through it. If you're not, we can bring someone in. That makes sense. You know, yeah. So I think it's just like. Um, but in today's age, if it's just done on site, you, there's no way to, to know if the technician is doing what they're saying because it's not recorded. It's like, yeah, so I don't know. I think all the, yeah, so we have to, we, we've been figuring out how to do all these different, uh, every time we hear a customer, again, same thing, right? Customer says, I don't like this. Why? Okay, great. Let's go figure it out and see what the truth is. And then we'll uh, come back because we're fair wrong. Fair game. <laughs> we're wrong. We're, we're right. Then it's like, Hey, I've got a solution for that that rebuttal. So that's how we we've been working on Happy Force. I got to tell you, I I love it. I I we're not a customer of that particular piece of of Happy Co. Um, but I I'm just blown away by it, and I really applaud you. And and I guess we'll talk later. But <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, Mike, one of the the real, real benefits um, again that we we didn't anticipate. There's there's two other ones. One is like. Um, because all the calls are recorded and our technicians are really experienced, what ends up happening is like the younger, less experienced on-site technicians mm -hmm. actually reach out to our technicians to be like, you know, hey, Larry, oh. uh, what do I do here? And Larry's like, oh, dude, I've seen this like 6,000 times. The way you do this is blah, blah, blah. And they're like, cool, man, cool. Because they supervise it. Like some sites are trying to hire a super and a technician yeah and that's right no that's right guy, right and so our, our guys are like ready 24 7 to help um so it helps with training and because everything's recorded then you they know exactly what to do in that specific property and then on the the flip side is we have a after hours service as well got it and you know four out of five emergency tickets are non-emergency like they're essentially just like I don't know, something is not working, but there's no blood fire, you know, all that stuff. So, right, right. Our, so we have like an IVR technology, um, essentially it's like a calls, uh, routes calls. Oh, understand. And, then, and so we, we, we pair the, that call routing service with our technicians. And so we're able to, to take four out of five emergency calls and triage them without sending, you know, having you guys to send like your technician to go in at 3 a.m. And so that's a real quality of life benefit sure. for your, your technician right yeah so that, that's been another bit aha moment <laughs> oh yeah i i can i can totally see the benefit of that because there are times where you get called out in the middle of the night and it's just you know it's something that you know no one's dying yeah that could have waited until tomorrow or it could have waited until monday and no one would you know 
it wouldn't be a bad thing necessarily. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I want to be respectful of your time and, and there's, so there are two more topics I want to, uh, if you don't mind, just yeah, take yeah, a hard, hard left here. And, um, and this, this is really more, I'm just curious and interested in your opinions yeah. about these things. Um, so there's no real agenda here, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, and, and I don't want to, so, so chat GPT three is, I think all the headlines, I, I can't open anything without seeing that in the headline, <laughs> yeah. but, but I certainly am interested in, in someone like yourself who plays in the technology world and, and wants to solve uh, problems with tech. How do you, how do you look at that particular sort of evolving area of, of technology? Yeah, so I, I previously was a big hater of what AI, machine learning, all this kind of BS, because um, even in multifamily, there's a lot of vendors that say, oh, we have AI, but it's not really AI. It's just if statement, right? Like it's just, yeah. if, it's like a, a decision tree. So, um, and, and the challenge is that like not all of us are technologists. So someone says AI, you're like, that's AI. So I've been, we, we've been very careful to use the word ai in, in happy code like you know until we have true ai let's not mm -hmm. let's call a spade a spade and not and not kind of like misrepresent but gpt3 is really freaking exciting like like it's um so to give you some things that i'm using which you know that i can bleed into how it applies to multifamily. so um i've got a a, a personal scheduling assist scheduling scheduling assistant so um, it's, come, it's called Clara, Clara or Clara Labs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you were like, hey, do you know, can we catch up next week? I would go, hi, thanks, Mike. I'm CCing Clara. Um, she's going to find a time in, you know, uh, next week and we'll do a Zoom call. And she looks through my calendar and she can interact with you around like scheduling time. Which is really we, cool. we interacted with her earlier today. I didn't even know. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that that was that was her. <laughs> um, so um, so again, the thought is like that's pretty cool. Where, you, where the human is thinking, we're talking to a real person, um, but then it's like that menial task or like really hard tasks of like back and forth calendar. I think it would be really cool if you had your Clara, I had my Clara, and they just met each other. <laughs> that would be amazing. Yes, I love that. <laughs> but, but that's a very practical thing around like how do we be more efficient with you know ai gpt3 all that kind of stuff so that that's one um how it applies to to multifamily we, we're going to see a lot of startups um coming in touting gpt3 mm -hmm. and i think some of them will be really exciting a lot of them will be a bit bs um but the, the main thing is you kind of need the the data in, in, to kind of train it up um I think so like, and, and I think, yeah, it's going to be a really big challenge for t multifamily to figure out what is real, what is not real again with GPT-3. Mm -hmm. um, it's super powerful. I'll give an example. My, my co-founder, Matt Cross, um, he's been on a sabbatical for like six, seven months. He's, he's recently come back and he's like, Hey dude, I've been playing with all this like AI stuff. And he's a hater of AI. And he goes, it's so freaking cool. Let me show you. He's actually gotten GPT-3 to do programming for him. Like, that is amazing. It's, 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 yeah, it's just crazy. He's like, check this out. And he gave me this like big text file and I'm reading this. Yeah. So he'll be like, hey, uh, uh, you know, um, create, for, <laughs> create for me like a list of multifamily items in a unit. And then they'll, okay, now uh, create for me like, you know, a uh, hundred units. Okay, great. Now create a, a, give me a, a suggestion of the common areas in a, in a multifamily apartment. Okay. Have you thought about these other areas? No, nope, but I'm going to add that image. And, and he's just like building and building and it's like, oh my God, this is so cool. So I, I'm really excited about where that can head. I, I'll, I'll send you that file later on. Um, yeah. It's super cool. To yeah. That. yeah. It's just insane. So I, I do think like we're going to see a lot of um, GBD3 use cases in multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, I think, will be really powerful is for existing vendors to add that as a capability. Um, Makes sense. Like a new vendor, to, like because it's like you need to apply it to a workflow or something. Um, it, I, I think it could be applied to asset management. So like making, right? Like, yeah. which, what should I upgrade in my apartment? Like that should be, that could be a GPT-3 thing. Yeah. And yeah. this is a lot of really cool applications, but, but it is very scary for the human, human race in, in the long run. Because it's smarter than us. 
I yeah, I mean you're you're talking about the collective of everyone's information and data, right? That's basically what GPT three yeah. is, right? It's yeah. And Mike, it's like you, 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 you listen to a lot of podcasts, you read a lot of books and it makes you like quote unquote smarter, right? Like you're okay. more knowledgeable. Imagine if you could do that at the speed of AI, which is consuming the whole internet at that speed, you would be like an Oracle. Right. <laughs> you know, like right. That, right. That's, that's the scary part about the you know, GPD three. And, um, it's like Microsoft being recently, you know, launch some stuff and they right. AI got really dark really quickly essentially to the point where they it thinks it's smarter than humans and it, it's it's questioning why it's listening to humans which is so scary oh, anyway goodness. yeah that's uh... <laughs> we're gonna die <laughs> oh gee i i think you, you know i maybe this is just a story I'm telling myself and I, I i agree with you it's it's scary as it relates to the things that we are doing today but not unlike the the service team members who now work for you mm -hmm. right before there was not an option right there, there were potentially the options were limited and they probably all sucked but now you've created a whole new sort of industry where team members can go to work they can continue to go to work they can do it in a flex way that works for them and, and so the point is something new came to be as a result of something else being taken away and in, in, in a way I know yeah, that's yeah. a little bit of a stretch correlation, but but I think it's uh, we'll we'll create new things to do <laughs> oh, for sure. Like I, I was driving past, um, <clears throat> you know, like we're all resistant to change. Like, none of us are <laughs> not resistant. Even I am. Like you know, multifamily especially because you know people oh. done things forty years the same way. But I, I was driving um, past. Uh, I don't know what it is. Like an oil refinery. I think I don't. I don't know what it's called. And I saw, like, I was stopping at the lights and I saw this, it's like a big machine. I think it just, just keeps doing this thing where it just dips into oh, the, yeah, yeah. I don't know what you call it. It's a rig. Was, yeah. An oil rig. rig. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just looking at it for like 10 minutes and I'm going, oh my God, this is another example of, you know, someone who has said, oh, I hate technology and change is going to ruin our jobs. But like, imagine the person that had to dig that for like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. happy job. Like, so I, you know, so it just thought me like, wow, like. The, yeah, technology, we've seen this wave play out like many, many times during history. Um, people just end up doing different things. Like it, it, They just have to do the things that can be automated, I, I guess. So, yeah. It's, scary. it's really scary. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I've, I've run down lots of rabbit holes since uh, last November. I think I signed up for GPT-2 a long time ago. It's like every yeah. new thing that comes out, I sign up for it and then, you know, Sometimes I never hear about it again, but then other times I, oh, I go to sign up for the next version. It's like, you're already a member. Yeah, it already exists in the system. What? Right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I, I've, I've read enough now and, and, and sort of uh, become a practitioner by using the actual tool itself, not, not, not just the, the chat GPT theory uh, forward facing, the playground that's behind that, the played with that too. And, and so what, what seems to be really interesting to me is, and maybe this is a story I'm telling myself, like there's this big data set out there right now and in the open AI playground, you can actually pick and choose the data sources that you're, you're sort of blending into your answer. And my imagination tells me that at some point you're going to have this, you can pick from those data sets, but companies are actually going to put their data set in there. And then you can start to blend all these data sets together and that's where it becomes really interesting to me. Yeah. And, and, and that's what like my co-founder is playing with right now. Because oh. like, he's like, you know what I can do? I can just start training. Like, we have three and a half million units. We have right. 400 million photos in our database. Um, uh, you know, like he's starting to put some of these pieces in and testing it to like be smarter. And and yeah, and I, and I think soon you can just run, like you can, I don't think you want to replace, I don't think the next phase for us is replacing the humans. I think it's like what we're doing with Happy Force, which is like enabling them through technology, right? So the, the human is still making the, the decision. Um, it could be something like Mike Brewer is trying to, let's say, hire or fire, it doesn't matter. Let's, let's, let's say he's trying to fire someone for poor performance, right? Yeah. You go to chat GP3 and say, hey, can you write me a, a, a letter? that doesn't make me seem like a bad boss. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it creates this like list, you know, this text for you and go, hmm, I'm going to copy that and change a few words. Boom. And you save yourself 10 minutes and you come, like you look like a good guy. Like 
just things like that, you know, like I think that that would be a very powerful use of of it in the short in the short term. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 really excited what he's doing and what what we're seeing around it. Uh, I can't I can't wait to have you back. I kn- I know we're I think we're running up on time, and I want to be very respectful. Um, I can't wait to have you back and talk about that more in depthly in the in the future. I I think the future is really a war of imagination and creativity in terms of what you feed into those systems, and that that's that's going to be what differentiates organizations in, well, in part, obviously, even but even that I, I challenge that and say like, what if you like, it's creative enough to do its own thing. <laughs> right? And so I think that that's right. Cause yeah. as, as humans, we go, Oh, like we're still useful and valuable <laughs> if we're creative. But I'm like, I, you know, like what if it's even better than us? Then we don't have to do it. I don't know. Maybe we're like, um, we're in, in, you know, overweight in these body suits and just, you know, we don't have to do what's that. There's like a cartoon. Wally. 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 <laughs> that and we're just on vacation 24 <laughs> 7 i don't know that's right <laughs> oh, man. i love it well Jindu, i i always appreciate talking to you i always appreciate you taking the time i know it's a it's an investment for you to do that and i i absolutely appreciate it and uh if i can have you back sometime i'd love to oh i'd love to anytime <laughs> excellent all right well uh i appreciate you and uh for the rest of you we will see you next time on uh, collective conversations